30 years ago, I walked in here with a machete and in the company of John Willis, who had inherited the estate. Um, we've written about it, we've talked about it many times over the years, but it still seems a remarkable thing that two people who knew nothing about gardening uh, should arrive in what is probably now considered the most romantic garden in the world. John, of course, um, uh, entered a long-term relationship, which is still going today, and we've become great friends. And my other great friend at the time was uh, John Nelson, the, uh, the builder who was actually working at my farmhouse at the time that I discovered it. And he came up the following day and he looked at me and he said, all my life I've been waiting for a great adventure um, and I'd like to join you. And to be honest, we entered a jokey relationship at that point, which was that um, I would talk about it and he'd do the work. And we became like a pirate gang. We, we, we traveled the county trying to find the things which would enable us to do it without a budget, say, that the National Trust would have. It's interesting to note that, of course, the National Trust and the RHS had turned down every opportunity they might have had to, to work here. They said it was beyond redemption. Um, but John and I would, uh, as you walk around the garden, you'll see cobbles and uh, drain, drainage ditches. And you may wonder, where did those cobbles come from? Well, now, 30 years hence, I can tell you, we would go at three in the morning with a tractor with sacking on the back of the trailer and we would go down to Port Holland Beach and take cobbles because we couldn't get cobbles otherwise. And we went to Nanpian Methodist Chapel and we at auction bought the timber from there and that's what actually led to the restoration of the working buildings here. So at a cost that we were told would cost somewhere around 20 million pounds, we probably restored the gardens with volunteers and ourselves, John's cunning. I mean, he worked, people often say they work all the hours that they're given. John really did, he was working by hurricane lamp and it was just like an obsession, a complete obsession. And it cost us around half a million. But what is particularly interesting today is, I mean, we, we set out to tell the whole opera, which was to put back a garden as it would have been in its heyday. And when we did it, we were the only place in Britain that was doing it. And every person who came here, or just about every person who came here, they would go into the melon yard and they'd go into uh, the potting shed, for example, and they would imagine that their grandfather, whether it was Prince Charles of coming or, 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 or someone from, uh, uh, from, from Malaysia, they all believed that one of their relatives would have been in a potting shed like that because it had that allure of um, fecundity, abundance, the sense of well-being, nature controlled and a very primitive thing, which is this sense of abundance that I, I hadn't realized that almost all of us, when you sit in a big vegetable garden, you may not know about vegetables, you may not know about gardening, but there is something profoundly uh, what, comforting, is that the word, to seeing this sense of plenty. And then of course you think, going back 50,000 years, plenty equals contentment, doesn't it? You're not having to be a hunter-gatherer. Um, so at that stage it was, it was romantic, it was uh, really well attended, the public poured in and of course Eden got built on the back of that experience. Uh, the second strand to it was that we found the, 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 the famous writing on the wall in the, um, uh, in the Thunderbox room, which is the, 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 the posh word for toilet, um, where in 1914 all the gardeners had just whiled away a little bit of time writing their names under a slogan which said, come ye not here to sleep or to slumber. And that effectively gave John and I the drive to tell the story of the ordinary men and women who'd made a garden like this great, uh, rather than the lords and ladies. Um, because it was a tribute, if you like, to the people who for, for century after century had made this place a stage on which they led their lives. The thing that has changed for me is that over the 30 years, of course, uh, all the magazines, the country livings, the country life, every lifestyle magazine has, you know, they've dined out on the back of, oh, isn't it nice, they, you know, look at these vegetables, look at this Swiss chard, beautifully presented, and uh, you can go and drizzle something on it. What has actually happened in the subsequent period has been that we've come to realize that we live in an age of big agriculture in which the choices of the fruit and vegetables that we eat are not down to flavor uh, or any particular attribute except that they all look the same. They come out the same, the same weight, the same color, all the rest of it. And they are pretty uh, battle hardened against the elements. What is happening now is we realize with fossil fuel dependency on our crops all over the world, 
um, that we're going to have to look at new crops that actually are not dependent on fossil fuels. I mean, you may not know this, your, your readers or listeners may not be aware of this, but that if you were living in a post-apocalypse age right now, you will probably starve because the varieties of fruit and vegetable and particularly grains that we grow all over the world, the seven major grains, are dependent on fossil fuel inputs, both for fertilizer and pesticide, to survive which means that if we didn't have them, they would die, we would starve. Suddenly, when you look around these vegetable gardens, the really important thing to remember is these guys were scientists, applied scientists. They were working out how, in an age before refrigeration, could you let people live for 365 days a year. So you were choosing for flavor sometimes, but also for keeping. Um, so it's really interesting that 30 years we've gone full circle from being shishishi tourism to actually uh, a museum at one level, but a living, a living bank of really, really important stuff that I think is going to have a complete second life as we go forward in the next part of the 21st century. So Heligan's future is about being incredibly relevant, whereas its past was about being in aspect to make people go, ooh, wasn't it nice in days of yore? So I love the fact that we've actually outlived a fashion to actually become the fashion. Um, and so, you know, if I was to be struck by lightning right now, other than the regrettable loss of life to myself, I would feel that the gang that have made this a most incredible family um, have actually done a really proper job in preserving something which is now uh, going to have importance going forward, as well as a place in the heart. And of course, you can't have going forward without love and romance and beauty. So I think we've got both sides of the human coin. I've always been uh, very suspicious of people who look for the 21st anniversary, the 30th, the 50th, the whatever. It, it almost speaks of a poverty of imagination. Uh, I think for us it's, it's a pit on in the rock face of our journey somewhere else and our celebration at being uh, 30 is simply a restatement that we're glad we exist, we're glad that other people are glad we exist and now the next part of our journey is to create a place that inspires other people to garden and grow uh, horticulture in a very very different way and our absolute obsession here is that we need to re, uh, refocus our attentions on the skills of the science of agronomy of horticulture and agriculture because if we cannot encourage young people today to feel excited that this is a cool thing to do we're actually going to lose skills which are going to see us going back to the stone age and I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating and that's why Heligan is so marvellous. You know, a lot of people died in a war in World War I to protect certain values, but the people who were here protected other values which are only now coming to fruition. And I'm sincerely proud, as are all my friends and colleagues here, um, that we've lived this journey to a point where actually we've got a big smile on our face and a sense of purpose as we go forward.